I was groomed starting young. So he would always have his hands on me. These are just a few of the alleged victims of horrific sexual abuse at the hands of priests in Pennsylvania. Who would have believed me, a priest in 1948 or 47 would abuse you? Or do that? Never heard of such a thing because they covered it up. Survivors who shared their stories on video and with a Pennsylvania grand jury, which spent the past two years investigating the child sexual abuse scandal in six dioceses going back decades. Priests were rape, raping little boys and girls, and the men of God who were responsible for them not only did nothing, they hid it all for decades. Today, surrounded by tearful victims, Pennsylvania's attorney general released the grand jury's long-awaited report. Over 1,300 blistering pages, perhaps the most detailed and disturbing account to date of the sexual abuse scandal in the Roman Catholic Church here in the United States. Predators in every diocese weaponized the Catholic faith and used it as a tool of their abuse. More than 1,000 victims in all, more than 300 priests singled out by name, and dozens of high church officials accused of covering it all up. And this is just one state. Oceans of secrets were unveiled today in a time capsule with this grand jury report being released in Pennsylvania. One priest in Harrisburg, Father Augustine Michael Gaiella, allegedly targeted five of the eight sisters in one family during the 1980s. A Catholic school teacher reported the priest after hearing disturbing allegations, but church officials dealt with the matter quietly. Gaiella retired voluntarily in 1988 and continued to molest girls into the 1990s, a common pattern in so many cases, the report says. The cover-up was sophisticated, and all the while, Church leadership kept records of the abuse. In this case, the official in charge was Cardinal William Keeler, who, when he died in 2017, was held up as a champion for sexual abuse victims. But the report finds Keeler covered up for Gaiella. Again, a common pattern. Predator priests were allowed to remain in ministry for 10, 20, even 40 years after church leaders learned of their crimes. In those years, their lists of victims got longer and longer. The report also calls out Washington, D.C. Cardinal Donald Wuerl, the former bishop of Pittsburgh and now one of the most prominent Americans in the church hierarchy. According to the report, there were multiple cases in which Wuerl informed the Vatican but allowed known offenders to quietly transfer rather than face charges. If there were allegations, we dealt with them immediately. Wuerl disagrees with some of the findings and defended his record on CBS. We're very, very sorry that this happened, and that's why we've taken the steps to see that it doesn't go on. The story of clerical sexual abuse is not new, but even more than a decade after the Boston Globe's Pulitzer Prize-winning expose chronicled in the Oscar-winning movie Spotlight... I pull out the 14 most damning docs and I attach them to my motion, and they prove everything about the church, about the bishops, about law. Actor Stanley Tucci's character there is Mitchell Garabedian, one of the attorneys who represented the Boston victims. What is being reported in Pennsylvania right now is unfortunately the tip of the iceberg. There will be a lot of victims coming forward in the future. The report comes amid a new wave of allegations in the church abuse scandal. Earlier this summer, World's predecessor, former Washington, D.C. Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, became the highest-ranking U.S. church official to resign in disgrace following allegations that he sexually molested seminarians decades ago. Father Boniface Ramsey is one of the whistleblowers who reported McCarrick's behavior years ago in a letter to the papal nuncio, Pope John Paul's ambassador to Washington. And I sent the letter, and then I never heard a thing. Wow. That was it. I know that my letter was received. I sent it registered mail and everything. Um, but, but I never got a reply, an acknowledgment. I never got an acknowledgment. Last month, the Vatican removed McCarrick from the public ministry. Pope Francis accepted his resignation from the College of Cardinals and ordered him to observe a life of prayer and penance in seclusion. McCarrick obeyed, but said, I have absolutely no recollection of this reported abuse and believe in my innocence. 
Today, the Pennsylvania diocese covered by the grand jury report each issued statements acknowledging it and apologizing. And in my own name, and in the name of my predecessors, we are sorry. I am sorry. The Bishop of Pittsburgh we went on camera. Must. There were instances in the past, as outlined in this report, when the church acted in ways that did not respond effectively to victims. Bishop David Swift Zubik went on to note that the church has since implemented reforms designed to prevent anything like this from happening again. Attorney Mitch Garabedian doesn't buy it. The Catholic Church is trying to take a more public relations approach of, oh, we're sorry, uh, we, we really feel bad for the victims, we failed children, yet they haven't put any safeguards in place. Almost every instance of child sexual abuse we found is too old to be prosecuted, but not every instance. He did offer victims some comfort. This grand jury report is justice. Survivor Mike McDonnell, who was at today's press conference, says it's a start. Some of the survivors shared with me that they felt like they were going to a funeral today. Well, welcome to Christian Answers. My name is Pastor Jeff Short. And today I'd like to talk about something that's been in the news quite a bit. I'm sure you've all heard of this Roman Catholic homosexual priest scandal where the Roman Catholic priests in the state of Pennsylvania have been documented, many of them over the last five decades, five or six decades, and they have preyed upon uh, young seminary students, they have preyed upon young boys in a predatory manner, and now there is a big crisis in the Roman Catholic Church in Pennsylvania, and this crisis will probably be exported to all kinds of states because grand juries in those states are going to be opening up investigations, and this is just the beginning of a huge mess for the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there was this big scandal back 16... 17 years ago, around the year 2000, 2001, when the pedophile priest scandal hit, where you had priests actually molesting uh, young children. This time, the scandal is more of the variety of molesting teenage boys and seminary students. But the common factor in all of these uh, Scandals is the homosexual priest element, which our culture doesn't want to talk about because right now homosexuality is a protected class. And so if you are an LGBTQ plus whatever person, you are protected in special ways from criticism. And so our culture has carefully avoided any mention of the homosexual element as much as it can. Uh, it's becoming rather obvious that the homosexual uh, predator priest scandal cannot be covered up anymore. And the Catholic priest is going to have to deal with the problem of homosexuals in the priesthood. Because if you think about it, why are these victims almost always, not 100%, but almost always boys or men? Well, it's pretty obvious that these priests are attracted to boys and men, vast majority of these predators, and not girls and women. And so you have a homosexual priest crisis in the Roman Catholic Church. So we've heard from Catholic apologists that this is not a problem with the priesthood, this is not a problem with the celibate priesthood. I'm sure all of you are aware, or at least should be aware, that in the Roman Catholic Church, you can only be a single man to be a priest. You cannot be married unless there are certain, cer certain circumstances as if you came into the church 
from Anglicanism, for example, if you were already married, you can then transfer your clericalism into the Roman Catholic Church and go through a number of other requirements to become a Catholic priest, even if you're already married in the Anglican Church, and that is permitted. But as far as seminary students getting married, going into the pastorate in the Roman Catholic Church, you can't do that. You have to be a celibate single priest in order to serve in the Roman Catholic Church. That's been the rule for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, the interesting thing about it is in church history, that has not been the rule for from the beginning. That has not been the rule. If you look, for example, in the New Testament, you will see the early church did not have that rule of a celibate clergy. They didn't call them priests either. That's another important thing, but we'll talk about that later. The clergy, they didn't even call them clergy, but the pastors, the leaders, the evangelists, the teachers, the preachers, the leaders in the early Christian church, as far as the New Testament describes, there was no rule that said you had to be a celibate single person to be a Christian leader. Now, we know that there were single celibate Christian leaders in the church. I think the the most the most glaring example, and I'm not talking about Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ was single. Jesus Christ was non-married. Jesus Christ was a celibate single male. But we're talking about the church that Jesus Christ left behind him. Um, I think we would not do well to bring in Christ as the example of all the leaders in his church simply because there was no rule, obviously there was no rule from the New Testament record that you had to be a single celibate male to be a church leader. And if this had been, if, if the fact that Christ was single and celibate and male were that important, he would have taught us in his words in at least one of the gospels. And then the early church would have reflected that rule in its operation in the first century, but it didn't. And Jesus didn't. He didn't teach any such rule. So in the early church, the very earliest church that we have record of, there was no celibate rule for church leaders. We see, for example, that Peter, the chief apostle, and the man that the Roman Catholic Church calls the first pope, we see that the first pope, if he was that, which I dispute, because that's an entirely different category of leadership that is brought in that is nowhere described in the New Testament. But if, oh, for the sake of argument, let's just say that Peter was indeed the first pope, okay? Then why wasn't he single and celibate? Why did Jesus choose as his chief apostle a married man? If there's, an, if there's a rule, or there should be a rule, or if there's a papal office and that papal office should be celibate. So here we have in the earliest record, we have an early church of Christianity established by Christ that doesn't have the strict celibate male priesthood rule that we see the Roman Catholic Church operating under. So where did this rule come in? We know that the early church had married leaders Probably uh, a majority of the apostles, the original apostles, were married. Uh, probably we know that many of the other uh, leaders in the first century that came after the original apostles uh, were married. We have record of that. So where did this rule come in that in order to be a leader in the church, you had to be single and a celibate male. Well, it came in 
gradually over time uh, during the Roman Empire in the early stages of the development of what is now called the Roman Catholic Church. It is not something that was originally taught by Jesus. It is not something that was originally taught in the earliest of the early church. So it was something that developed. It was something that evolved. And I want to say that that evolution, that development is wrong. Now we know for a, sure, for a fact that it did develop from what we see in the New Testament as an open pastorate or open leadership for men of all states of life, uh, single or married. We know from the New Testament, for example, that uh, the gift of singleness is not given to all men. And we also know from the historical record of the early church that the, the gift of singleness was not given to all men and that all of the leaders in the early church were not single. There were married men and there were single men. There was no rule. Now, what happens when you make a rule that God doesn't have as a rule, when you make a law that God has not given as a law, when you teach something that Christ himself did not teach, or you're more strict than God himself, what happens is you run into problems. And that's what's happening in the Roman Catholic Church today. They have a priesthood that is built upon a false development within the history of the church. It's a false development. It never should have developed or been permitted to develop. It never should have been established. Right now, it's, it's been established for century after century after century. It is not found in the New Testament, but it's something that developed over the history of the church. But not everything that develops in the history of the church is something that we should tolerate or put up with because things can develop in the history of the church that are wrong, that have developed in the wrong direction, that have become tradition when that shouldn't have become tradition. And just because something has been established for hundreds and hundreds of years doesn't mean that it shouldn't be corrected. And so one of the things that the Roman Catholic Church could do is to get rid of the rule of the celibate priesthood. That's one of the things that they could do. Now that would be very, very difficult for them, but not impossible. Because we've heard from other popes, for example, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, when someone said, could the church change its rule on the priesthood and allow married priests? Or is that an infallible doctrine of the church? And he said, no, it's not an infallible doctrine of the church. It's a time-honored tradition, but it's not an infallible doctrine of the church, and it could be changed. But a lot of Roman Catholic traditionalists and apologists argue that it shouldn't be changed. And the reason they argue that it shouldn't be changed is because they look at denominations within Protestantism, for example, like Anglicanism. That's probably the closest as far as church style. There are church, high church Anglicans that look very similar to Roman Catholic Church uh, worship services. Of course, they're not alike. I mean, they're vast differences. But as far as the outer form, they look similar and they practice many of the same features that you would find in a Roman Catholic Church. You might even uh, get some incense burning and a high church, Anglican church, and so on and so forth, uh, vestments, and all kinds of things that look very Roman Catholic, but they're in uh, Anglicanism, which is sort of a halfway house between the Continental Reformation, the German Reformation, 
and the European Reformation in the 16th century and Roman Catholicism, kind of a halfway house. So the Roman Catholic Church apologists look to Anglicanism and say, see, they open up their priesthood to men, uh, men who are married, and look at the disaster that that has caused in the Anglican Church and in the Episcopal Church in the USA. And, and that's true. There is a disaster in the Episcopal Church in the USA and the Anglican Church worldwide because of its rampant liberalism. But that's not the reason the, the celibate uh, priesthood rule and Anglicanism's failure to adhere to that, that is not the cause of its downfall. Anglicanism isn't declining because they allow married priests to function within their church. That's not the reason of the decline. You have to go deeper. You have to go into the theology and you have to go into the compromises that were made on core doctrine. These are the main reasons why Anglicanism is in decline because there are uh, Protestant denominations for example, like the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, totally different than Anglicanism, but within the Protestant camp. And they obviously permit men who are married to function as pastors within the Southern Baptist Convention. And they're not declining. They're not uh, in apostasy. They're not compromised. In fact, the traditionalist Roman Catholic Church and the biblical-based evangelicals like Southern Baptist Convention, they get along great on most of all the social issues because as far as like abortion and against the profanation of marriage and all host of social issues, the Roman Catholic Church, the traditionalists within and the evangelicals get along great because at least they know that there's this historic Christianity that both sides hold. But if you look at Anglicanism, for example, in the Episcopal Church in the USA, uh, it's a liberal denomination, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And it's not because they allow for married priests and pastors. It's because of the doctrinal compromise and the watering down of historic Christianity, totally apart from married or celibate pastor issue. So when the Roman Catholic apologists point to Anglicanism and say, we don't want to do that because look at the Anglican church, that is not a strong argument. Uh, that is, you, you might as well point to the Southern Baptist Convention and say, well, you see, they, they have a married priesthood and they hold to orthodoxy and they are growing. So you could point to that group for just the opposite argument. So pointing to these different groups and saying they're doing well because they allow for married priests or they're doing bad because they allow for married pastors is not a good argument. I think the case for a married pastorate and priesthood that the Roman Catholic Church should look at is simply to recognize that their rule is not a rule that was found in the New Testament church. And then beyond the biblical teaching, look at it from a, I would say, human perspective and a biological perspective. Look at it this way. If you don't have the gift of singleness, which the Apostle Paul teaches in the New Testament, he says some men have the gift of singleness. He wishes all men had the gift of singleness. Not, not all men, but the ones he was writing to. He wished that men had the gift of singleness, but each one has his own gift. So that means that some men have the gift of marriage. They have the graces and the gifts and the abilities to live with a woman. And then other men have the gift and ability and graces to be able to live without a woman. 
So each one <laughs> takes gifts. Now that doesn't sound, we don't usually hear that, that it takes a gift to live with a woman. But I'm sure married men will testify that it does take a lot of special gifts to be able to live with a woman. And I'm sure you can have single men, man after man, say it takes a lot of gift to live without a woman happily. And so you have gifting. Now, the problem with the Roman Catholic Church today is obviously it needs a lot of priests. Because if you have all these dioceses and you have all these churches, you're going to need a lot of priests. Now, the problem is, if you do the math, what is the percentage of the male population that actually has a gift of singleness? And if you run the math and you try to calculate this out, you're going to come to the hard question about asking something like this. Is it possible that the Roman Catholic Church is actually ordaining hundreds and thousands of men all the time because it needs priests that don't have the gift of singleness? In other words, they are not given the abilities and the constitution for a lifelong, long-term celibacy. And yet they're ordained as priests. Now, if that's the situation, there's a tragedy and a train wreck headed for them in their life because they've got this sexual energy They've got these gifts and abilities and desires for uh, companionship, but they cannot exercise them within the Roman Catholic structure. And so what happens? They end up recruiting a lot of homosexual men who don't see the priesthood as anything that would hinder them in exercising their gifts and desires and their abilities in life. And so you get a lot more homosexuals signing up for the priesthood than you would have in the Protestant denominations. And you would have the ones who are in the priesthood who don't have the gift of singleness dealing and struggling with this celibacy rule and committing acts of fornication and acts of sexual immorality because they don't have the gift. And that's a disaster too. So you have all of this mess created simply because this rule was never meant to be a rule or Christ would have given it and the early church would have exampled it in their life. So the rule for the celibate priesthood in the Roman Catholic Church obviously needs to change and they need to come back in line with the biblical teaching and that would open up a lot of opportunities for really uh, gifted men to sign up for the Roman Catholic Church leadership positions and there wouldn't be a priestly shortage and there wouldn't be this big mess that we have in the newspapers every day about some priests doing this act of immorality or scandal. So I think that this is a very simple solution. I think it's very obvious, and I hope that uh, if the Roman Catholics uh, want to correct their problem, they're going to have to implement this change in their leadership structure. And if they do, I think it will probably solve most all of their problems, uh, the kind that they're having in their church today. Well, I hope that's been helpful, and we'll see you back on another edition of Christian Answers. God bless.